will continue to grow. The work he's done here has led to more mural painting opportunities elsewhere. But the pride he feels for his adopted hometown makes these all the more special. Towns need an identity. Chillicothe really doesn't have one. But I believe with the murals, it's really brought in a lot of tourists and really showcased our town. Like small towns everywhere, Chillicothe loves a parade. Kathy Ripley has seen quite a few of them. As a reporter for the local paper, she's covered just about every kind of story in Livingston County, from celebrations to tragedies. Kathy also thought she knew quite a bit about local history. But apparently, like everyone in town, except John Irvin, she wasn't aware of that game-changing occurrence on Elm Street back in 1928. And she discovered it entirely by accident. In 2003, Kathy was fishing through microfilm in the public library, researching a book to tout the town's days gone by when it popped up in front of her in sepia and white. It said that Chillicothe was the first place in the world to offer sliced bread to the buying public. And then also there was a full page ad in that newspaper. I thought, well, this needs a little further investigation. <laughs> Sufficiently convinced that the story was solid, Kathy took it to print. Soon, the Kansas City Star came around, then the Associated Press. A few phone calls later brought the corroboration Kathy was hoping to get. It was Otto's son, Richard, Christine's father, calling from Arkansas to say, absolutely it's true, and that's me on the bread rack. The 88-year-old soon returned to the scene of his dad's big breakthrough, a visit complete with limo, ride, and public reception. I do remember that Ed Douglas was there, and he came up to me. Is this really true? This is really happening? Well, we got to do something about it. Something that quickly started looking like this. The Sliced Bread Committee put a plaque up at the original Slicer's site and got Kelly cooking on a prominent downtown wall. They launched a bread baking contest to call out local cooks. This is a traditional white. Then soon added a little jam. Complete with the kind of souvenirs, the committee hoped no tourist could leave town without. This mug is a story of sliced bread, toast coasters, one of my favorites. We could have a shopping bag. It doesn't take much to be a hook to get people to want to come to your town. Like when we were looking at different towns, there was a town that has a frozen dead guy. Nothing famous about him, he's just dead and he's frozen. And so we think the uh, sliced bread story is much more compelling than that, in that, as you know, it's a standard of all innovation, past, present, and future. And yet, despite all this, the town still lacked one thing, something with blades. The original slicer had disappeared. A ruined relative donated the second of the Smithsonian, which promptly packed it away. That is why Scott and Steve, remember them, found themselves winging their way on a winter's day along I-80 in western Nebraska. Thanks to the internet, someone saw what the town was seeking, knew somebody who had a slicer, I'm not making this up, and voila, two men and a van stand on the cusp of regaining a piece of the past from a chatty couple in Kimball. Randy and Sandy Harmon had been trying to sell it for a friend on eBay. He was trying to clean out room in his shop. He said, I've got this bread slicer, do you think it sells? I said, I have no idea, we can try. I'll try to sell anything I want. Steve called, talked to me, and see if we still had it available. I wasn't sure. I talked to my husband, he got a hold of Roger Dosey, and he was getting ready to put it down to his junk pile. It was going for the crusher? Yeah. He was going to sell it for scrap iron. Well, scrap iron is $200 a ton. <laughs> Close call, but the gods of innovation must be smiling on this quest. A hundred bucks and a couple of t-shirts later, the deal is done. And even better, the boys get to chat with Arnie Christensen. Arnie remembers working with the machine in his pop's bakery. I, I can remember when my dad bought the slicer, it was uh, in the early 30s. The blades travel in opposite directions, so when it slices, they go like this. 
back it up a little bit more. How do you rate the Komodo? A hundred. I'd give it a hundred on a yeah. scale of ten. No mascots to send them back east, but the boys have snacks and adrenaline to push them along. Except for a small oil leak and fewer MVGs, the cast iron load offers no resistance on its way back home. And now it's one thing to go grab a piece of history at the swap and shop and get it safely back to town. It's another to know exactly what to do with it then. Which is why, since that day in December two years ago, the auto rowetter slicer has been held in captivity at an undisclosed location. And normally, that might be the end of the story, but shocking plot twist ahead. Turns out Chillicothe was not meant to be a one-slicer town. So, how about a quick recap? Slicer number one <coughs> didn't survive the 70s. Slicer number two went to Washington. Now, 10 years ago, after Kathy's big discovery, the local museum, at the time they were all volunteer, approached the Smithsonian and got turned down flat. So right now, it's really good to check the emails. But they didn't have this lady back then. This would be a section of our graphs. Pam Klingerman is, as you might suspect, not from around here. England, by way of Ohio and Denver, with extensive museum experience and charming persistence that can slowly open doors. Are we on an earthquake fault? How long is the response time from the fire department? So for almost two years, very quietly in case the whole thing were to fall apart, Pam and company have been jumping through hoops to ensure that one well-guarded piece of American history might be available after all. Fingers crossed. It's a, what's the what's toes the too, legs, you know. <laughs> oh, and a friend in high places doesn't hurt either. Claudia Allen is a Chillicothe native who's served on the Smithsonian board. She cut a lot of the red tape for us, and so her email before last was Otto is smiling. <laughs> and today Kelly will start making the mural. I mean, yes. that's kind of that feels like that's a step. Amazing. <laughs> when I got the yes, you have permission, it was like, oh. Uh -huh. We can bring out this bench uh, to sit here and have it angled so it's coming to give it a more three dimensional effect. Then that machine sits in here. We want the, the machine to be our focal point. For a can do it kind of guy who loves to paint history there may never be a better opportunity than this. He had something special that he kept at it. And finally, he found somebody that, you know, saw what he saw. And it just happened to be here in Chillicothe and Frank Bench and two worlds collide and the Midwestern mentality and belief that, you know, you keep pushing till something happens and that's what happened here. The Smithsonian does not send national treasures out in minivans. This climate-controlled art shipping truck pulled up safely at the museum with its precious cargo. But here's where the luxury ends and the forklift takes over. The man at the controls is Marvin Holser, president of the board and a guy who knows the job well. In mere minutes, Marvin's got it sitting snugly inside museum walls, waiting for uncrating after it sits for a spell. This doesn't mean there still isn't protocol to be observed. A conservator from the Nelson Atkins Museum is on hand to ensure that. I probably should take a, take a picture of the inside here. After all, this baby has to go back to D.C. in three years. It smells like fresh pine. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> there are plenty of curious eyes peering in, not to mention theories thrown out about how it actually worked. So I bet you loaded it. I bet it wasn't big enough for a Getting it unpacked is pretty easy, but the next step, not so much. At 500 plus pounds, there is some risk in getting it safely placed on its pedestal. That's when you call the fire department. Everybody ready? One, two, three. Okay, you guys got it? Because I can't count. This is the original. 
Yeah, the slides were. Yep, that's awesome. Appreciate hearing that. With their mission accomplished, the firefighters head back to the station to await that next distress call. But there's still plenty of work to do at the museum as they get everything ready for the big day ahead. Today is the exact 85th anniversary of the first loaf of sliced bread. This place has filled up fast, and it's a virtual who's who in here. The mayor, Claudia Allen, Pam, Kelly, Beth Douglas, and of course, Kathy Ripley. All leading up to a bench, a row editor, and a pair of oversized scissors. Hey. It's been a long time coming, and everyone's ready to get a glimpse at the guest of honor. It's an auspicious occasion that also marks another milestone. The first time anyone can recall that the members of both founding families have gotten to share in the spotlight. Never in my wildest imagination did I ever think I'd be sitting here today. Are you so proud? Oh my God, this is so This thing since sliced bread I knew came because of my grandfather, but I never really thought about it. And, and to see it at the scene pictures. I couldn't touch it, but I thought about it. <laughs> Why shouldn't they let the world know? Small town with great values and a lot of creative people. As for that saying, no one's really sure. Some think maybe it came from an early ad or a book. Some point to a time during World War II when the government actually banned sliced bread for a while in support of the war effort. Ironically, a professor from Rhode Island who was working on a study of it died before his research could be published. So, no matter where it came from or what it exactly means, it still seems wherever you go, people are saying it. It's the greatest thing since sliced bread. It's the greatest thing since sliced bread. That's the best thing since sliced bread. It's true. I'm Mayor Chuck Haney, mayor of the greatest city since sliced bread. It's the greatest thing since sliced bread. It's the best thing since sliced bread. No, it's the greatest thing since sliced it's bread. The best thing since sliced bread. The greatest. The best thing since sliced bread. Well, you're an English teacher. When someone says the greatest thing since sliced bread, what, what does that mean? Um, it means it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. <laughs> Principal funding for Slice of Life has been provided by...